For this week's video, I would like to present another layout design. Here is the customer's site. It is the upstairs of his home. There are two good sized rooms. This one is around 23 something, and this one is about 13 by 16, something like that. Feel free to pause and count the squares if you want to. Anyway, the overall area is somewhere in the region of 750 square feet. So it's a good sized railroad. This long, narrow room is an attic space which initially was meant to be part of the railroad, but by the time I actually got around to start drawing it, it had already been repurposed for other things. So that was no longer available. So anyway, if we have a look at part of the customer correspondence, we can see that he wants to model the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad from Elkhorn City to Paintsville in Kentucky. He wanted the interchange with the clinch field at Elkhorn City, the yards at Shelby and Paintsville, and a whole load of mines in between, as well as a logging facility a little bit further north. Now he expected it to be two full scenic decks plus staging, and he wasn't keen on the idea of reversing the direction of travel between the decks. He wanted train to continue looping around the room in the same direction on both decks, which means, of course, that we're going to have to find a way of passing either through or in front of the bathroom, and we're going to have to get either over or around the stairs as well. Now we talked about the various methods of getting from one room to the other and at the north side with the bathroom in the way I've drawn three different routes we decided that route A was the best for the lower deck where it can pass between the toilet tank and the storage cabinet above it obviously that wasn't going to work for the upper deck without removing the cabinet so we decided that a drop down section across the middle would be the best way to go it's going to be at around five foot elevation so there's plenty of space for just a simple drop down flat with a hinge. That would stay locked in place during operating sessions. Anyone wanting to use the bathroom would just duck under it. While the route around the outside would be a fixture at all times. Another possible route would be to cross in front of the door with some kind of moving section, although he said he did not want to do that. So we eliminated that idea. Now on the other side of the room, there are a few different ways of going. The first route that I thought of was to wind its way over the top of the stairs and around the entry passage. Now passing in front of this door would lead to a rather awkward moving section because of the curve. So that's why I suggested going through the attic space, but that was vetoed. What he wanted to do was climb up and over the aisle on what he referred to as John Allen Bridge. For those of you familiar with the Gorian Defeated Railroad, this was going to be something similar to the Great Arch between Cold Shoulder and Skull Mountain on that layout. And depending on whether or not there's going to be a turnback curve in this corner, that would either be alignment D or alignment E. Initially, I was trying to avoid going through this area because my gut feel was that more than likely any builder that would block off this area instead of putting a closet in there is probably using their area for air ducts and things like that. Although the client later informed me that he watched it being built and he was confident that that was a void space. And he later had me just route the main line through the base of that. But we'll get more to that later. Now obviously a bridge of this nature has to be higher up than even the tallest operator because you can't take the risk of somebody walking into it and potentially destroying thousands of hours of work. So it needs to be somewhere in the region of 80 inches elevation, which of course is round about the height of a standard door. So we could actually take this route and go over the top of the attic door instead of in front of it. And although I did suggest that idea to the client, by this time he was already sold on the idea of John Allen Bridge. Now, just for reference, there are a few other obstructions in the room. T is the thermostat and S1 to S4 are various light switch locations. And although it's not a huge job to move them, if they can be left where they are, it's so much the better. The client had already given me one of his own sketches, which required some of the light switches to be moved. But if we're able to leave them where they are, that saves having to bring in an electrician. So now that we've figured out how we're going to get from one room to the other, it's time to start sketching in various layout footprints. I'll just go through those quickly. Feel free to pause it if you want to. 
what I'm doing in every case is keeping to a three foot aisle width and a minimum of a 30 inch radius curve. That's what these circles are, possible turn back curve locations. I haven't filled in this room in all cases because there's only a couple of different ways to use it. I'm mainly trying to figure out what's the best use of the main room. And in some of the plans, I'm using the area over the stairs as an extension of the secondary room. So there was about seven or eight different footprints and the one he said he liked the best was this one with the diagonal peninsula in the main room. Although he didn't want to build this extra area over the top of the stairs, he wanted to leave this open and provide more operator space, which in a big room like this is a very good use of an extra few square feet. So now that the basic footprint is selected, it's time to start running the main line through the various scenes that he wants to include. Although I started on level two with Elkhorn, this is actually the lower staging showing how it wraps around the south and east walls with the peninsula available for a reversing loop and then a helix by the room entry up to Alcorn. The three areas that he wanted to include on the southern subdivision were Marrowbone, Millard and Sutton. Since there wasn't really enough distance to get three separate towns, I combined Millard and Sutton and Shelby Yard was always intended for the smaller room. Then we have the helix up to John Allen Bridge, where we're going to pass over the walkway. So skipping level three for now, we see that John Allen Bridge is on level four, and then we've got to find some way of getting back down to level three, which will be at about 60 inches elevation. So to get back down to a sensible operating height, the main line is wrapped back on itself in three tiers. And I'm not quite sure where, but I believe the Clinchfield Railroad did in fact do exactly that, not so far away from the area that he's modeling. So although there is no such arrangement in this area, it's not altogether unprototypical for the type of railroad that he's modeling. And the three areas that he wanted to model before the Northern Yard were Broadbottom, Water Gap and Van Leer. So now we can see that the main line is making a second lap of the railroad running in the same direction as before, passing through the bathroom again and into Paintsville Yard. And then I use the area over the stairs for Howard Lumber before heading back up the outer helix to North Staging, which will be on top of the lighting valence in the back room. Now this plan was drawn before he decided that he didn't want anything over the stairs. So this area needs to be chopped away and the helix moved into the corner of this room here and we decided we also needed to move Paintsville Yard to the other room so that we don't have one yard on top of the other. Originally my plan was to try to arrange it so that one is operated from the north end and the other from the south, but still that might have put too many operators in the rear room at the same time. So now let's move on to the next iteration. Here we have the helix moved into the corner of the media room, which means that we end up with a very tight area in this corner for the north ladder of Shelby Yard. Yes, I know it's the south side of the room, but compass direction would be north. I've also shown two slightly different locations for John Allen Bridge, although as I already mentioned, we ended up moving it completely. Now with the helix in this direction, as I said, this is too tight. Now the other thing wrong with this design is that the engine terminal is at the wrong end of Shelby Yard. Here I've shown bits of different levels. I've shown how Shelby is improved if we put the helix running the other way around. And doing that, there's also the possibility of herniating one lap to give us an extra scene in the middle of the room and space that would otherwise be unused. And here I've shown how Paintsville Yard can fit on the peninsula. And I've drawn in two alternative Y locations. The other adjustment I've made here is to keep the top tier of main line on its own scenic deck and then drop down through a one and a half lap helix into the scene below. And when I sent this off to the client, he decided that this was much better all around. So now with most of the major scenes located in the room, it's time to start working out track arrangements. 
just to make sure that the desired turnout sizes will fit and things like that. And I started with Elkhorn City Yard. Now, although my primary reference for much of this design was following the route on Google Maps, the client wants to model the 1950s, and obviously track arrangements have changed a lot since then, mostly in the way of simplification, and a lot of the old industries and mines have changed dramatically. But the client has already done quite a lot of his own research. As I say, he dug up a couple of track plans which he felt were reasonably accurate and sent me a whole lot of photographs of the period he's modeling. This was about the third iteration of Elkhorn Yard. At this point, the client decided that it was pretty close and that it was time to get on with the rest of the railroad. So here I filled in the remainder of the lower scenic level. Now, when I started drawing in the switching areas with full size turnouts, I found that there was insufficient running space between the towns. So what I've done here is introduced a couple of time wasting loops. In this corner, instead of following the aisle, I've run the main line several feet further into a hidden curve just to add a little bit of running distance between these two towns. And then between Marabone and Millard, I've introduced a time wasting loop, basically a single lap helix. It means that Sutton is now at a slightly higher elevation than Elkhorn, but that's not a problem. It actually puts us at more of an ideal height to get through the bathroom high enough up that it's easy enough to lift the toilet tank just in case it needs maintaining, while still being comfortably below the storage cabinet above it. Now, when it came to Shelby Yard, I reduced the yard from what was visible on the satellite photographs on Google Maps. Now, this curve is more or less in the right place, but the one at the other end was in the opposite orientation. Shelby Yard having been built basically around an S-Bend as it follows the stream. And it's also divided into two sections, which I was just about able to maintain. In reality, there is several hundred yards between the two sections of the yard, but on the model, we'll just have to be content with a single tree line dividing them. The engine terminal is in approximately the right place, although, as I mentioned, the main line should curve the other way. And I've also got a mine branch exactly where it should be on the prototype if one ignores the fact that the curve is the wrong way. And because the mainline staging yard in this room is going to be on top of the railroad instead of under it, we have the opportunity to extend this branch down to a staging area under the yard. And this is something that he didn't expect to be able to include, but he liked the idea. I've shown how the herniated helix can give rise to another mine or industry location. Although at the moment, I'm keeping it to the minimum just in case we decide we want to extend the benchwork over the other side of the room for any reason. In some of the preliminary plans, we needed to get a loop of track in this corner. And by keeping this area fairly small, we still have room to do that if we need to. Anyway, before continuing with the third level, we decided to play around with this area. There are a lot of different options for this area. None of them are ideal, but they all have their advantages. So we decided to investigate some different configurations for this area. Now, after establishing that we did not need a loop in this corner for anything, it becomes possible to extend this extra area into the middle of the room. This allows us to make it a decent sized scene. And as drawn, the switching lead is the inside track around here with the main line being on the outside. Now note how the helix runs in the same direction as we had it before. Although it means that this scene is now running in the opposite direction to the main line. Now we decided this was justified because in the real Shelby Yard, the northbound trains are actually heading due south at this point, where it is following the river all the way. In this version, we are running the other way through this area and reversing the direction of the helix. Here I've drawn what is necessary to get the mine staging far enough below grade to be able to be easily accessible under the yard. And I made this slight modification, herniating this helix as, as well, so as to give us an extra scenic route on the way. Since the prototype branch line is indeed quite long, well, it's long enough to pass through several towns and have a couple of passing sightings en route before the route actually divides. And then one route goes to Perry and the other to Darton, where there are mines at both locations, with the Perry mine being much closer to the junction and the Darton mine being further away. Here I've developed it further, 
Instead of going to staging, I've shown the possibility of adding a low-level scenic area with one of the mines actually modeled and the other one represented by staging. And this takes it even further, modeling the junction and both mines with no staging at all. And when I sent all these variations to the client, he jumped at this one. He was absolutely ecstatic that he was able to get these mines in when he really didn't think that he was going to be able to. He was thinking that at best, this branch line would be represented by a single stub ended track leading off into a hidden area somewhere. Now, up until now, I had put a 90 foot turntable in Shelby Yard, figuring that that would be big enough for a 2662 with a short tender, which would be an appropriate locomotive for use on the mine branches and other locals. But since he already has a Walther's 130 foot turntable, he asked if it was possible to include that, allowing him to turn full size articulated locomotives. So I played around with that idea a bit, and by rearranging the order of the turnouts here, I was able to get it to fit. It does mean that we're going to have to shave the aisle a couple of inches, but at the moment we've kept the three foot aisle throughout, so that it's not going to be a big deal in a short dead ended aisle such as this. At this point, I've kept the same arrangement with the through track becoming a garden track and the roundhouse all off to one side. Whereas in this one, I've twisted it slightly so that the through tracks line up with the roundhouse, which is not quite the way it's supposed to be, but it does make better use of the space. The other thing that I've done in these plans is kept the double track all the way through this area, which we've now called Shelbyana, being a satellite of Shelby Yard and actually the name of the town where the prototype Shelby Yard is located. And on the prototype, the double track extends several miles beyond this point, And there is a control point with a pair of crossovers, which we decided we would include. Now, the other difference between these two plans is which side of the seam put the crossovers, either here, allowing a longer run from Shelby, or on this side, being closer to Shelby. And although this is a good train length, we decided that we wanted it further away from Shelby. Even though having them on this side, the client thought was aesthetically better. And since this is the bottom of a helix, I broached the idea of adding one lap of helix before this scene. Not only would that increase the running distance between the two, but it also gives a lot more clearance for the scene below, which would otherwise have had minimal headroom, thus gaining the best of all worlds. So at this point we have all of level two and the back room of level one pretty much worked out. Next, I went back to filling in the rest of level one. And while we were talking about the low level scenic areas in the second room, we thought about the possibility of doing the same in the main room as well. Instead of going directly into staging, the clinch field could have a run of its own with the staging under the peninsula. And once again, the client loved the idea, pointing out that it was a very scenic area that he'd always hoped to be able to include, but didn't think he could. And whereas level two starts with the north portal of Pool Point Tunnel. The helix represents that tunnel, even though it's a lot longer than it should be, it being a fairly short tunnel on the prototype. And then we come out onto Pool Point Bridge. The next passing siding is at a place called Laurel. I don't know if that's the name of the siding, but there is a town of Laurel nearby, so that's what I call it. And then it looked like there was plenty of room for south staging on the other side of the peninsula. Although, as we'll come to later, it turned out to be a little bit cramped there. So I'll show you in a later plan how I fix that. So now that the first two levels are taking shape quite nicely. It's time to start moving up. Here is level three drawn out to the same level of detail as the other two levels. We see the main line dropping down from the summit at John Allen Bridge into Broad Bottom, which was the next town that he wanted to represent. Because of the need to put a one and a half lap helix in this location, we have to break the scene. But that's probably beneficial anyway, because the prototype locations are quite a long way apart. And as you can see, there's only a few feet between them. Now, although it's not shown at this stage, we decided to put another time wasting loop in under this helix, adding about another 18 feet of run between the two towns. And instead of modeling water gap, I've suggested Stratton because there's a big mine there. There's also a branch line that goes through Allen City. So I've shown how that can be included as a couple of stub ended tracks. There was also a branch line at Broad Bottom, but there really wasn't anywhere to put that in. So I figured we'd just have to make do with the one branch line only. 
Now at Stratton, the track becomes double again all the way through Paintsville. The other town that the client asked for en route was Van Leer. And it doesn't look like there's a great deal here, although there is a pair of crossovers. And there's a location shown on Google Maps called the Dawkins Trail, which clearly used to be a branch line diverging at this point. So I've assumed that it was still here during the period that he's modeling and shown how it can be included, at least as a dummy. I suggested two possibilities here. Either it could curve and run down behind the road, hidden in the buildings, and it looks like it's just about long enough to stage a single train on. And the other suggestion I made was that he just use it to park a maintenance train on, because maintenance away equipment is really interesting. And this is a good place to park it. He can always call it out to some area on the railroad just to throw a wrinkle in the works during an operating session if he wants to, or it could just stay there where it's on display and not in the way. And although there is no evidence of any rail served industries at this point, there's plenty of room to put a couple of industrial spurs in, just to add some additional operational interest, since there really is very little other than mines on the layout. Now, Paintsville is a fairly close copy of what is currently there. I had to flip it from east to west to get it to fit and reduce it from about 20 tracks to, I think, eight. But otherwise, it's fairly accurate with the main line passing through, having no connection, and the secondary main running past the depot on the other side, the Y ran behind it. And this is basically a track arrangement of the spurs behind it. Although when I sent him this client said it was very different in his period. He asked for a completely different variation and also eliminating the Y so that we can avoid having to have grades in this area. He figured he was never going to need to turn locomotives at Paintsville and that it would simplify the construction. The other thing he didn't like about this plan was the turnout in the bathroom. We talked about the possibility of putting a curved turnout in at this location, but that would have left virtually no lead track. So eventually we decided to continue the double track all the way through as far as Howard Lumber. Now this area is still to be developed. I just threw in the bases of an interchange and some sawmill spurs and a logging line climbing up, crossing over the main line to a lumber camp. And we can also see how the double track ends halfway up the helix, just before we need the space for the secondary helix to wrap around the outside. And then here is the top level. I've shown how we can put in a continuous run connection between the two helixes right at the top, just before John Allen Bridge. North staging is wrapped around over Shelby Yard with the return loop over the helix. Of course, we can cross over aisles at this point because we have full walk under headroom in the region of 80 something inches. Now, since we have a very long single track section between Howard Lumber and Broad Bottom, it's a good idea to put a nice long passing siding at the summit. Actually, I decided that two sidings were better because I did notice a few places on this route where there was a three track arrangement. At this point, the client had asked for double track over the John Allen Bridge. Obviously, we don't want to make that a siding because no real railroad would build a passing track on such a big bridge as that. I made it look like a double track section of main line. We later dropped it back down to single, which will of course look much better and greatly simplify the turnouts in this area. Well, at this point, the vast majority of the track has been properly located and most areas have reached their final form. So this brings up the end of phase one of my two phase design process. And with this video already well over 20 minutes, I think it's a good point to break. And I will finish this layout design in next week's offering. So I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and I hope to see you back again next week. Thanks for watching and bye for now.